I've traveled the world. I've seen a lot of things and I've met a lot of people. Okay, well, I'm Angela Reed, president. I'm 44 years old and I'm from the parish of Jamaica, um, Clarendon. The people who lost their loved one, I know your pain because I mean it true. Yeah. I have a normal childhood life. You know, I did allow to live, play, and grow as children. It was fun. You know, I could remember as far as listening to Brother Anansi's story, Regal Me This, Regal Me That, and you know, listening to dopey stories from the children. And the elder, they were very disciplined and old fashioned. We were classified as country picnic. Yes, I remember the days that we used to go to the pump house, the river and sit be beside, and sit beside the elders who doing laundry at the river. Fruits and vegetables was of all sorts. So that what even led me or lead me to start doing creative writing. There was so much um, to learn and to gain experience from in my childhood. From my birth until I was 13 years old, it was beautiful. It was beautiful sitting with the children them on weekends when we don't have school, up by um, Mass Derrick shop with Mass Derrick grandchildren, watching the whole black and white TV. Yes, we couldn't wait for weekend to come to watch Who is the Boss and Titus and Lime Tree Lane in the line of duty, Oliver Samuel and Titus, Countryman. It was beautiful. The elder, they were beautiful. It was so amazing. You know, the rest of children sitting down by the river and put on a pot, you know. It was safe too. It was safe. We, we didn't experience any crime and violence. I born in the 80s and as I said, um, as far as I could remember, um, 10, 11, 12, 13, going to pump house and shower, um, like have a splash. The boys were not aggressive. We were safe. They were disciplined. Even when we climbed the mango tree and the June plum tree, you won't find the children, boys who peep. They wouldn't do that. We were so disciplined. Going to, we go to school together. We look out for each other. And the parents, them were very disciplined. I remember as far as back when we used to, when I used to go to school, you would find all the children in the community, one or two parents, left the house and come to meet us, you know, on the street, halfway to make sure we come home safe. And they take home all the children. One or two parents will take home all the children and make sure they, they reach home safe, even if they're not from the same household or in neighboring community. Just that's how safe we were. And that is how um, the elder back then, that is how disciplined the elders were. So I have a good childhood um, growing up until I was 13. My father was an armed security officer. So he used to work with a micro security company. And one of the location that he used to be is Cool It Bag Juice Factory. But then you used to have the old arms house hill where they have an old arms house. And they have different type of men, you know, from the community who used to gamble up there. My father was one of them. But he was an armed security officer working with micro security company. He was very strict, yeah? But I learned that he was very abusive too. I also learned of the story that he was very abusive to my mom. Yeah, but I didn't know that he would have gone so far. My mom didn't know that he would have gone so far, you know, to go as far as abusing me as his child. Um, my father, rem as far as I could remember, yeah, he supported me financially, but he was very cruel. And that's the reason why my mother, after pull away from the relationship while she was pregnant with me. And my stepmother has to pull away from the relationship too because he was very um, aggressive and abusive. And now my mother would send me for lunch money every weekend or you know every Monday morning so I could go to school. And one day when I went by my dad, he I remember he after school, he prepared a meal. He was there alone and I ate 
and when I ready to go and put down the plates, he hold my hand and he take me in the room and that's when he abused me. I was frightened because I've never experienced anything like that. As I said, I grew up among my mother's side, a family in uh, in East Clarendon, where I I never experienced such. We allowed to the only thing I experienced going to school, playing, sweep the yard, maybe wash the dishes and play with the children, and you know being monitored by parents and elders and neighbors. We 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 were from the lower part of 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 Clarendon so we don't experience anything of such crime or violence or anything so it was shocking to me it was frightened and at the age of 13 I didn't know what happened to me what was happening to me why it is happening to me you know but it was very frightening and hurtful and very painful yeah no, no I understand what do you think is like for your mom as well what do you think? my mom didn't know what happened to me because they didn't talk about it my dad threatened me not to say anything to anyone or else he would have kill me, would have killed my mom, would have killed my mom family. So knowing that he's a harm security officer, knowing that my mom said he used to be abusive to he, to her, knowing that my stepmom said the same thing, I become fearful, so I fearful, so I didn't say anything. And I live with that for years. I live with that grief and that pain, that anger and that hurt. Before, before um, it's not my first time leaving home, I run away from home when the incident happened because my mother said my mood and my attitude changed. But I see that where it was hurting her, you know, when my mood and attitude changed because I couldn't tell him what happened to me. So I run away from home and that's where my struggles start. But I get over that, I become an adult, start having my children. And I went to St. Lucia. I, get, I started traveling. It was one of my dreams growing up and becoming an author. But um, after having my children, it was still a struggle because I, I couldn't keep a relationship because of my past experience. I keep having flashes and it can get me frightened and, you know, trigger panic attack. So my children father was very good to me and we have good relationship. But I think, you know, I was still scared of my past. So I started traveling. And while I started traveling now, I met my husband in St. Lucia in 2007. We get married, it still didn't work out. And I flew back to my country because when he married to me, he was with his child mother and he didn't tell me anything. And I married at the age of, I married at the age of 27. Yes, I married at the age of 27. He was 25. So I flew back to Jamaica still continue my traveling and that is how I gained citizenship in St. Lucia. But I had never gone back there until 2016. After I was married 2007, I've never gone back there until 2016. And I tell, that is when I now become an adult, more mature and talk about what happened to me when I was a child. And I speak about what uh, my dad did to me as a child, he abused, he abused me. And it, he, the police said he still, I still could get justice. He still could be charged. And that is how they hunt him down, they find him, they lock him up. But as I said before, my father had a relative family. They're very powerful. They're more, mostly police and soldiers and lawyers and, you know, petty sessions and they're very powerful. So that is where the threat started coming in while he was in custody. Can you just tell me when he was arrested, when you were able to get justice? What did that feel like? Did that he, change things? He was arrested in 2014. Um, it, I feel a relief, not for revenge, but I released from all my, my hurt so I could move on. But then I was thinking wrong because it take a turn. Due to corruption, the threat started coming in that if he goes to prison, I'm not gonna leave and all my family's gonna, you know. So that will come in from my sisters and my by his side, by my father's side, my brothers, my uncles, cousins by their side. They didn't want that to come out because, you know, they are will be knowing people. They're very powerful people. You know, they're people that, you know, the public look up to. So they didn't want that to come out. So if he goes to prison, you know, and you know, me talk about it too, and the police involved, it shook everyone. 
and he was in custody. Um, while he was in custody and the threat coming to me, all these threats coming to me where gunshots were fired at my home, letters was, was written and pushed beneath my door. I went to the court and I tell the judge about it and he, she put me under witness protection program and I was removed from the parish but it didn't end there because due to the corruption of the Maypin police um, there was a breach of where I was but Minister of Justice take it up in hand quickly and they removed me again. I don't know what happened to him if he did go to prison or if he did get released because while under witness protection program and they were the one that should take me to court you know i mean their care knows i can't go to court on my own or maybe the judge didn't want any more evidence because of my family behavior and his behavior and the threat towards me maybe it's saying that he's guilty you know and i was telling the truth and there was evidence that i pulled from how many years um, you know, about what he did to me. There's evidence. So it becomes a controversy while in the witness protection program where I have to go to the TV station, the radio station, and it hit front page of the newspaper. The media and the press take it up in hand where CVM um, did an interview and it hit front page of the newspaper. It was going wild all over Jamaica where other persons who are under witness protection program who were abused just like me, you know, while in the program, while lost their life, family members, lawyers and other persons coming out and talking about, you know, the negligences of victims while placed under witness protection program. So after I public the government, you know, um, what was going on after I go to the TV station and it was all over, I hit front page of the newspaper. Um, I was take off the witness protection program. They gave me some money because at the time I did have my my baby at the time um, was about one year old. She was about four months when I was placed on the witness protection program in 2014. But in 2016, when I left, she was about one year and a couple months. So I went to St. Lucia I because I didn't feel safe staying into Jamaica. I didn't feel safe having um the government to protect me i know you still have good police officers you still have good protection there but majority at that time was it was very corrupt and be, because of my family backside background of my family because of my family background by my father's side it wasn't um it wasn't safe and that is how i get out and went to saint lucia so when i went to saint lucia i tell the government what happened i talked to them and that is when they take me into protective custody and they protect me for a period of time. But my life was not the same because I left everything back home. I run leave everything and have a child now with me that I go have to start all my life back over with. <laughs> but they give me the opportunity in St. Lucia, you know, to go out and breathe. But I still never feel safe, you know, which is something that I didn't want to talk about. But you don't have that corruption in St. Lucia like you have in Jamaica. So they were quick to act on my behalf. And that is how I come to um, UK and seek asylum in 2019. But I got sick in 2019, have a mental breakdown, um, you know, couldn't see my children, were not allowed to communicate with anyone in Jamaica or in St. Lucia. My daughter was still in St. Lucia, the small baby and at that time so I, I left everything I was like um, I was a lonely soldier many miles from home so I, I went back home 2019 and that's when the immigration told me if there's any changes to your circumstances come back home the process of seeking asylum it can be a bit bothering it can be a, a bit stressful. I don't know if it's a system or the way they do things are maybe, you know, other immigrant may play a role um, making it bad for other immigrants. I'm not sure. But from my experience, um, I don't get as much support when it comes to, um, you know, counseling, coaching um, for my past experience and for my mental breakdown. I don't get much support with it. Um, back in St. Lucia, 
I get support when it comes to my mental health. I get support when it comes to my emotional trauma. I get support when it comes to my panic attack. I get support. Um, but here in UK, um, it's not much. I think they don't. It's not much. Even this, the, 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 the system have it in place. It's not much. You know, it's not much. So, yes, I've seen GP. Yes, I've seen the psychiatrist. At one point, I was um, admitted at an hospital in London um, for two weeks. And um, even now, I'm not on any medic medication. Yeah, so even now, I'm not on any medication. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of hectic, um, seeking asylum. You have to, I don't have much friends. My circle are very small because the immigrants are not really friendly and genuine and helpful to each other, each man to his own. And I also think it's a long process. I were denied twice and there was some confusion before with my old um, ARC um, number, uh, but they correct that. Um, so I'm here now. My experience, having bad experience seeking asylum, there's days when it's good when you get your accommodation, um, you get food to eat, you can show you at somewhere to lay your head. But there was time when I cry, I wept and moan, hoping someone would just get me, put me in a flight and send me back home. There's days and nights when I weep and moan in rain, in snow, in the cold out there. You know, there was time when I have to buy a, um, a ticket to ride the bus because there was nowhere for me to go, nowhere for me to stay. There was times when charity and organization and institution have to take me up like the passage in Victoria, St. Mungo's, um, um, and a few of them, like the churches in Croydon, because I once was in London. Um, and it was when I get section at the Bethlehem Royal Hospital, that is when I get placed in an NHS home. Yeah, and it was still hectic because I get involved with the police. I were not charged. I was not convicted because there was surveillance camera there. But I've gone through the storm seeking asylum. Honestly, if I didn't know it was like this seeking asylum, I wouldn't have. Maybe I would have lost my life. Maybe I would, it would be better. Maybe I would go somewhere else. Maybe I would have a bit different experience. But, you know, the experience seeking asylum, it's, it's very harmful to me because I've experienced a lot of bullying, a lot of stigma um, when it comes to my mental health. And I thought um, they said UK was like a woman country where they, you will be protected. They respect and love women and children. Not like men and boys are not respected and look up, but they take care of women. So that was the idea I have in my head. I heard when I was coming to UK. I didn't know that I go have to go through the struggle. I didn't know that I go have to suffer, <laughs> like suffer the way I suffer, struggle the way I struggle. It's a very hectic experience. Sitting home, I'm not allowed to work. And you know, um, yes, I have a roof over my head and I eat and so forth, but um, not being active, it put a strain on my mental health. It put a strain on my physical body where I now develop an enlarged heart and overweight. I'm also suffering from long-term COVID um, because I get infected while I was in the Bethlehem Royal Hospital in London um, where I was admitted uh, for my mental health, my mental breakdown. So, um, yeah, seeking asylum is very hectic. You know, it's very hectic and the process is very long. So if you're not patient or you can't have that patient, if you don't have that faith. As I said, even when I was in London, I begged to go back home. And, but it's because I was struggling with my, my long-term COVID and my mental, my mental breakdown. But um, I can tell you, the process is hectic. After my experience with child abuse and growing up, I didn't trust any man. You know, and that is the reason why my relationship didn't work out. 
that is the reason why my marriage didn't work out because I trust no one. I become so secure with myself. I become so obsessed with myself because I didn't get the support while I was in Jamaica. You know, after even when I talk about my my child abuse in 2014, I wasn't getting as much support. Before I talk about it, I used to go to the psychiatrist myself, um, the counselor, my herbalist myself. I have sleepless nights even when I become an adult. Have my children, I was so secure when it comes to my children. And I wouldn't want anyone to have the same experience that I have. Now, what I would say to parents who your children going through or experience this similar um, abuse, whether physically, verbally, mentally, or emotionally, listen to your children. In Jamaica, this is my concern. Parents tend to don't listen to their children. My mother didn't know what happened to me, but my father didn't listen to her, to himself. To, I don't know, he listened to his mind that led him to do what he did. Even though it was once and I ran away from home, my mother didn't know what was happening because he was no longer with my mom, right? My stepmother didn't know what happened. Even though 2024, you have people still living in the days, yes, of where those older folks would have said, I have gained that experience of abuse too. People just talk about it and for a day or two and nothing like that. Men taking them life and taking children life. Four children at once, five children at once, you know, woman fighting over men and they can't get the, the mother. They just take over the children life, take the children life and alive the child. You know, these are some of the things, you know, taxi man, bus man, bus driver, father, commonly, Family member, brothers. Um, I see a, a, a lady named Annie. She's one of them social media influencer who struggled with her emotional trauma. Queen Africa, come out and talk. And many more about it. There's a lawyer in Jamaica where there are two sisters named Bora Singh. They're lawyers and they can tell you that, oh, my mother was raped and that's how she conceived and, and, and have us by, by her, she getting raped. Yes? Um, um, a, a, a family... A, a, a most famous judge in Jamaica, um, Judge Pusey, right? He, she was raped. I think her mother was raped. And that is how she come on this earth. So it's nothing new in Jamaica. And what I would like to see is for the people of Jamaica to come together and to protect our children. But when you look at it, 70, 80% of them are the predators. They are the mentally abuser. They are the physical abuser. They are the, the one who bullied. They are the one who create the stigma on these victims so they're afraid of coming out and talk. These are the ones that are going to say, no, no, go so. You know, you know, me not believe you. Because some of them, once the man pay them bills and buy them some food, they're not taking what the children are saying and protecting their children. 2023, eight-year-old Talia Thomas performing her talent piece at the Minimis St. Anne competition. Here, she had a word for sexual predators who prey on children. So impactful was the message, she won the top prize. But little did anyone know that one month later, she would be a victim the perpetrator, someone she knew. Sources share this picture of him helping with her costume. Residents are furious. And my days of growing up, I've never have these kinds of killing and raping and what have you. It is a very sad situation. These children growing up in abusive home, listening parent children, um, Parents, mother getting abused by father, using words to these mothers. M parents who don't think before they use words to their children. Yeah, so these children grow up hearing words and knowing things um, from a young age because parents don't think twice. Yeah, they, they don't care. Uh, um, so what I would like to see is more things put in place for the children, more steps 
take for the children. I would like to see Jamaica be a better place. You know, I would like the Caribbean diaspora to be a place to live, work, raise their family and to do business. Not for children to have that experience of child abuse. Yeah, I, that's not what I would like to see for no country, not even in UK. Yeah, when I come to UK and I read the statistic of UK, how oh, many children gone missing per year. I'm saying, but what am I running from? Where am I running to? Every country had their own issues that they have to deal with. Yeah, I have never seen that until I come to UK. So right there and right then I realized that I have to stand up and fight. And it's only the fittest of the fittest will survive it. Right? No, it's hard for you to make the changes in Jamaica. Because you alone cannot do it. The government alone cannot do it. People have to come, come to their realization and come to their senses right and understand that this is your child not to touch your child it's it, crime and violence and abuse against women and children it has nothing to do with lack of unemployment don't tell me it's because you're hungry why you molest the child don't tell me because you're hungry why you beat your child don't tell me it's because you're hungry why you use certain words to your children don't tell me it's because you're hungry why you go out there and rape because if you're hungry you don't supposed to have mind and the flesh you're supposed to have mind thinking of how you can survive, how to develop options to do some backyard gardening. When you're hungry, you don't supposed to have the nature at all for the flesh. So it has nothing to do with lack of unemployment. It's the mentality of the people. Shane Barnett, the 23-year-old man who pleaded guilty to murdering his cousin and her four children in Cocoa Peace Clarendon, has been sentenced to life in prison. Wright and her children were killed by a relative at their home in Cocoa Peace. So at this time, Madam Speaker, I express my condolences and my deep, deep regret. And through you, I ask if we could observe a minute silence so so what i would like to see is the country or the government to put things in place what i would like to see is something to be done when it comes to abusing our children it has to stop we are not going to have healthy growing men and women who can think for themselves and act for themselves. They're going to think for the devil. They're going to think negative. They're going to act negative because they grow up and experience negative behavior and negative lifestyle. So I would want parents to come on board. I would like adults to come on board. I'd like the government and churches to come on board. Yes, and to support, stop violence against our children. Stop abuse against our children because anyone could be a victim. I'm a victim. You too could be a victim. Anyone could be a predator. Your brother, your uncle, your niece, your nephew, your teacher, police, soldiers, lawyers. Anyone could be a predator. Trust no one in your circle, your surrounding. And I urge parents to wait until you find that partner that you can talk to, that partner that you can relate to, to rather than go out there and venture out into a relationship because you want your bills to pay and your open door and letting uninvited guests in your life and your children's life. I urge the people of Jamaica, especially the women, they are very greedy. I urge them to come out and make Jamaica a place to live, work, raise your family and to do business. Make Jamaica a place where we want to come home. Make Jamaica a place where we don't mind struggle financially. Yes, make Jamaica a place that it can be successful for, to grow and, and, and have mature doctors and nurses and pilots and scientists breed from these environments. And I'm Angela Reed, President. I'm a victim myself. Don't fall victim. Trust no one. Right? What you think is what you attract to. You think negative, you will attract negative energy. You think positive, you will attract positive energy. I'm to a victim and a witness to child abuse or of child abuse. You too could be a victim. Stop violence against women and children. See something, say something. Tell what you know. But behind every dark cloud, there's a silver line. I felt you still alive, missing children. I know you're in heaven, dancing with the angel. To
lado. 